is the Hamilton police arresting me for political dissent. Can I please give him my phone, please? Can I give him my phone? This is a reflection of what Doug Ford Can I give him my phone, please? No, you cannot. Can I give him my phone, please? Joining us here on the OSHA, we have, of course, Kariva Syed. She's the lawyer who was arrested and handcuffed by the Hamilton police. And also Anthony Marco. He is the president of the Hamilton and District Labor Council. Thank you both for joining us on such short notice on the OSHA. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us, Laura. Well, you were both at an event that, unfortunately, Karima, I wish you'd had a better experience coming to Hamilton. <laughs> but let me just say, I'm sorry for what you've gone through. But you're here to tell us what happened, both of you, because I think it's so important that we understand. So, Karima, let me first ask you, how are you feeling? It must have been a whirlwind uh, number of hours since your arrest. Yeah, I don't know that I've fully processed the events at this point, um, but the most surprising emotion it has been shame. It was kind of humiliating and degrading to be treated like that. Um, and obviously I made the choice to broadcast it. This is part of a pattern that's a matter of public interest, um, but I feel kind of crummy about it. Um, but what, like, I mean, what makes up for that, I think, um, is seeing people's reactions to what happened. Um, so I, I am on the balance doing fine. You should not feel any shame. The shame is with the Hamilton Police Service for the way that they treated you, for handcuffing you and arresting you when you were there peacefully. And the shame is with the Doug Ford rally, of course, uh, for everything that went down. And I want to get into it, but but let me just say, <laughs> you know, there should be no shame. However, I that. well, uh, you know what? It, it kind of makes me sick because I got to tell you my first reaction when I saw the video, and I don't know about you, Anthony, was I thought, what are they doing? Are they arresting? you know, with aggressively another racialized peaceful person in this city because we have had a history recently of Roa Mohammed with a knee on her neck and Sarah Jama in her wheelchair. Do you think there was an element of that in this? Do you think that you were singled out either by the Doug Ford campaign or by the Hamilton Police Service because you are racialized? Is that at play here at all in your mind? There's no doubt that I was singled out by the Doug Ford campaign um, in that someone made a beeline towards me as soon as I showed up and told me I wasn't welcome. Um, whether that's because I am racialized or have loud opinions that critique Doug Ford or a combination thereof, I I'm more inclined to think it has to do with political speech, um, but I'm also aware that I occupy a space that isn't um, traditionally held by people who look like me. Uh, and I think that that is probably all the more grating. Um, so I, I think sort of that, that's my reaction, um, that I didn't comply as quickly um, or as obediently as um, the officer or the sergeant would have liked. Um, and that my asking, I think a perfectly reasonable question, which is what about my RSVP? Um, that was construed as defiance and even though I don't pose any kind of a physical threat um, I was manhandled by this cop. And you had an invitation can you just set it up I know a lot of people by now have probably heard you speaking about the details of what happened to you but just so our audience understands fully you took an uber to town to go to a rally you had an invitation you printed from online uh, to go to this thing Doug Ford put out the call you responded you showed up what happened when you got there what kind of communication did you receive um so initially we were waved into the parking lot um by a couple of it, it looks like volunteers um and we got out um there was no one else who had arrived at that point um a couple of other volunteers asked who i was with and i said that i wasn't with anybody. I was there just as a, a registrant for the event. Um, and kind of I was able to proceed to the hangar area, which is kind of in like this parking lot. It's a very big open space. Um, and as I was making my way towards the entrance where it looked like people would be going in for the event, um, the, the, this gentleman approached me and said that I wasn't welcome there. Um, I, I recognized him actually from an interaction earlier in May where I was uh, summarily 
uh, banned from the kickoff event, the campaign kickoff event. Um, and I thought maybe that was specific to the venue, um, which is why I was sure to RSVP and you know make sure that I was approved. I used my real name, my real email address. Um, this guy says, we don't want you here. We know what you do on Twitter. Um, we know who you are, just all sorts of vaguely threatening statements. Um, and he refused to identify himself. He refused to say whether he held a security license, um, what his role was with the party, um, whether there was a supervisor to speak with. Um, so I wasn't satisfied that this gentleman had the authority um, given that I, I had a formal invite and uh, I, I waited for police to attend. And when they did show up, um, I asked for a name. I was given a first name. I asked for more details. Um, and I think it's at that point that I became an annoyance. Um, and that's, you know, a couple more questions. And uh, I, I found myself in handcuffs. It didn't seem like you were posing any kind of threat. If they really wanted to walk you off the property for trespassing, I saw four cops in that video, much larger than yourself. They didn't need to put you in those cuffs. What do you think that was about? I, I think that that was punishment um, for being obstinate. Um, I, I think it was done backwards. Um, really the ticket should have been issued. Um, he already had my name and information. Um, so he could have said, I'm now writing you a ticket for trespass. Um, stand there, please hand me the ticket. And then at that point, if I refuse to leave, um, you know, it, it, either you're walking off the property yourself, we'll take you in the back of the car, but you're going to have to go. Right. Um, and, and I would have left, I would have left voluntarily. Um, and, and that's, I, I'm not one to stay and assert myself um, where I'm not legally allowed to be, but if I am allowed to be there, I will exercise that right. And, and it wasn't clear to me what that line was, um, but it, to, sorry, to, to your question, um, I, I'm not a big or imposing person, um, so I don't understand why anyone felt the need to lay hands on me. Anthony, you were there as part of a protest. What happened from your point of view? What was going on? Why were they treating the protesters that way? And what did you see happen to Karima? Uh, what was your experience of the night? Yeah, from a timeline perspective, we literally were just walking in as Karima was being let out. Mm -hmm. And so we certainly didn't see the beginning of the interaction. We, we, uh, we saw Karima being let, let, um, let out um, we'd never met before or anything like that. We didn't even have a chance to introduce each other there, introduce each, uh, each, each other. But it was, it was very, like walking in, it was like a very kind of horrendous first step. It's like you're walking in here with a group of protesters. Um, anyone from the ages of in their 20s to in their 80s, um, just kind of a mixed group of people who all don't want Ford back. Um, Hamilton 350 is largely concerned with environmental issues. The Labor Council were obviously there for workers' rights and and issues like that. And it wasn't a big group by any means. We maybe had 25, 30 people. Um, but that was the first thing that we were introduced to what we were gonna be doing there. And so it became very clear, very evident that the police were going to be defending that piece of property to the point where they were arresting people very quickly. Because when that happened, as soon as we showed up, we thought, well, cargo jet, they're definitely defending this property. Um, I've probably got more ticket line and labor experience that many of those cops have. So I, I know how to test my boundaries with many of them. And so I basically said, well, okay, if you're going to defend this line, then what if we move over to the street over there, which we believe is public property, mm -hmm. and just do a picket line back and forth across the street. And the same gentleman who Karima referred to earlier, who was kind of the, the fixer slash intimidator, who looked a lot like Stephen Lecce, by the way, but uh, that's an aside. Um, he basically, uh, he was coming up to me the entire night and basically saying, it's tonight, you want to spend tonight in jail? Is that why you're doing this? You want to be arrested? Like, I, I said, really passive aggressive, man, you're going to try and intimidate me that way. It's like, I don't get intimidated that easily. But it became very evident that as soon as we moved off the property and started picketing across the entryway street and holding up the line, the police would not come over because they did not have the authority 
to extend past the cargo jet property line. They worked on it. They certainly eventually got it, but we were there for at least about an hour and 15 minutes holding up traffic. And to be honest with you, it was really just four or five of us that were just marching back and forth across the street, occasionally letting a car in just like we would do on a picket line. Mm -hmm. And they did not have any authority to come over. And, and we realized that pretty quickly. And many of the older uh, protesters who were there would, were standing on the side, just holding signs like they planned on doing anyway. Um, but we found that it was rather effective and certainly got uh, the attention of the people that we wanted to get the attention of while we were there. What goal could they possibly have by sending Mr. Passive Aggressive's man, you know, the uh, out to kind of vague threaten and to, to say on camera that we know your Twitter, what you do on Twitter? I mean, that sounds like something we would expect in a non-democratic country. So, so maybe let me go to you, Karima. Like, as someone who's very vocal on Twitter, that's pretty chilling and that's pretty disturbing. And so what does Ford and company think they're going to achieve with these kind of tactics? I don't understand the level of secrecy, um, but it has been a consistent and recurring theme um, in the way that he ran his government. Um, so there's lots of secrets and not a whole lot of transparency or accountability. Um, so, I mean, it's not surprising in the sense that it is part of the same pattern of behavior we've been observing, um, but it is astounding from the perspective of someone who values democracy and freedom of political expression. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know how there's anything I could have possibly said that's more damaging than what actually happened. Um, you know, at last check, your video was almost at a million views. Uh, and in Canada, that's pretty rare. So it backfired spectacularly for Ford and his passive aggressive guy. And I think it made a lot of people say, hold up, even if they didn't know you <laughs> or know your work, what is going on? So what do you think is going on, Anthony? Do they not know that this kind of thing backfires in, a, in an age of social media and public accountability? I think the, the sad truth is that if the, if the representative that had come out was somebody from cargo jet or somebody from just uh, somebody who was on security, um, that would be one thing, and it would certainly still be as heinous as, as it ended up being in terms of the way that the communication was handled. The fact that this was definitively an agent of the party, representing the party, representing Doug Ford, coming out and being the way he was in front of all those people, that's the part that, to me, it's not surprising because I, I've, we've seen how this government has been over the past four years. You just, you think that you've seen all of stupid and then you see that extra level of stupid and you think, how could they even be this dumb to put somebody out there who's definitely working for the party, is essentially acting as their hatchet man for this event and is doing whatever they can to try and just suppress uh, people's free expression, free speech, their right to protest. Um, that, the, that's the part that shocked me the most. I, and you, you would think after four years, there wasn't anything more to be shocked about with Ford. Um, yet we've achieved new levels just a couple of days before the election. Well, let's go to that then, because, you know, I know that, uh, Karima, you're, you also uh, joined 1010, you're a contributor there as well. And we were just talking about the other day uh, on the, one of the shows, you know, are there going to be any surprises? Is this, you know, baked in the cake for Ford? And I thought, no, I thought we were just running out the clock. But clearly the handling of of what of you you know and the fact that the public is looking at that and saying you know, it's one thing to have kind of bodyguards or bouncers say you know move back move back i used to be a journalist they do that to camera crews all the time it's quite another thing to have a discussion in front of somebody's camera about how your your public statements and tweets in a democracy mean they know what you're all about. And, and I think I heard you on another show talking about, they talked about some dance that you were doing with them. Can you just try to explain for us what the hell they're talking about? Yeah, the the Stephen Leachy body double, um, you know, he kept making these analogies of, are we really gonna play this game again? You really wanna do this song and dance? And, and it, it sort of implied that I, had an ulterior motive apart from getting into the event to document it. Um, and, you know, I, I've done 
so many political rallies. Um, I have lost count. I think it's probably in the hundreds at this point, largely COVID, um, like anti-COVID measure or, um, you know, I spent time at the convoy occupation in Ottawa, um, but I've been to Liberal Party events, NDP events, New Blue Party events, um, and that that's just part of what I do. Um, and I, I really try to be fly on the wall about it. Um, sometimes I have interactions that are noteworthy, and I will post those. Um, and you know, there's characters along the way, but it, it is it's it's scary to think as well that. Um, presumably someone believed that there would be no repercussions for this um, and that it would be swept under the rug and it was a show of force that um, for its own sake really um, because again what could I possibly say that's so damaging there's Ivana she has a knapsack on there are lots of blue flags like that's the type of it's not um, I don't know um, so so yeah yeah I don't know they're probably afraid of mockery, right? Afraid of your satire, afraid of uh, your comics and things that you do. And maybe that's just because they have thin skin. But the you, know, you brought up the truckers convoy, you know, and there have been comparisons online, people watching your video saying, wait, hold up, you know, the, the what did the police do with the truckers? They, they did not arrest them cuff them within minutes really of a conversation they let them sit there for weeks so mm -hmm. how did that feel for you just the juxtaposition between what the truckers got away with and ford you know was not too tough on those truckers either um and then having someone from ford's campaign come out and tell you they know what you're up to and they you know cops are throwing cuffs on you uh definitely there is a contrast to be made there um one thing I want to say is, or maybe clarify the position, because I have a lot of people in my mentions who um, sort of suggest that I was calling for state violence against the convoy, right, and that, you know, I celebrated that, and how dare you, you hypocrite, complain about it when it happens to you. Um, I, I think that there are so many distinctions to be made. Um, but the fact is that state violence against citizens for political speech should really be um, very much a last resort, right? Not something that we jump to. Um, and I think the commonality between the situations is the use of police discretion in a questionable way. Um, and, you know, is it that police exist to protect private property above all else? And that's why I, I had such a swift reaction. Um, is it that I somehow don't present as, as sympathetic um, a cause <laughs> as the convoy occupation. Um, you know, I, I can only speculate as to that. Um, but I like the, the, the main distinction I would say is that I was not obstructing anyone. I was not actually protesting in any way. Um, I was there to be unobtrusive. Um, and that, that's how I approach rallies generally. Um, so nothing to suggest that today was, or yesterday was going to be a departure and, you know, something was gonna happen. That, that was, I, I was just there to take pictures and make some jokes. Anthony, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't one of the MPPs that were there also a member of the Hamilton Police Services Board? In other words, was there some sort of extra police presence something that made this event happen from your point of view i mean if karima has gone to all of these different events and is not an agitator you know we do see some people in canadian media who do like to get right up in the face and you know get a clip out of it um, but that's not what she does so what do you think was going on that led to the escalation so quickly and uh, the aggressive arrest I mean, there's a couple scary things here. The first thing that comes up, and I was, uh, it was in my head the entire time Karina was, was speaking last, was there's this concept of the concept, there's this concept of the undesirable at an event like this. In other words, everyone who's wearing blue and walking in with a blue election sign, you're desirable, you have freedom to move and do whatever you want to. Anybody who's not touting the party line is undesirable, and we're retaining the explicit right to deny you entry. Now, that is their right, don't get me wrong. 
The question is why the police force is acting as their private security in order to enforce that. And I can understand if there was, if there was very much clarity around um, the cargo jet property itself, then the police were probably going to try and enforce that. I don't necessarily agree with the way they enforced it. They certainly had a lot of steps that they could have taken before dealing with an arrest. Um, but ultimately what scares me the most is in that hour and a half interim between us moving off the property and marching back and forth across the street, a phone call was made to the OPP. The OPP issued a trespass order for the entire airport which further they wrote in that the Hamilton Police Service had the right to patrol and authorize and, uh, and enforce. And it was signed by someone from the Hamilton Airport Authority. Now, I know we're talking about local politics here at this point, but city council oversees the Hamilton Airport Authority. And so I wanna know who has a default explicit permission on the Hamilton Airport Authority to sign something like that without obviously a council motion, without consideration of anything, you can't tell me that this was an emergency powers thing just because the OPP called. So there was a lot of backroom stuff that happened in that hour and a half. And who knows who prompted it? If it was somebody locally, if it was someone on Ford's team, we all know that Ford has appointed people to the OPP before and there's a lot of connections there. But obviously in that, that, that intervening hour and a half, a lot of phone calls were made. And when they walked out, we took a picture of it as soon as they brought out and showed us that trespass order that it included the entire Hamilton airport, including what we considered to be proper city streets. They had city street signs up there. I assume that if any road work needs to be done, it's the city of Hamilton who does it and not the airport authority. Uh, if, if there's a right to be there, then we should have a right to be there as well. And we should have a right to walk those streets. You know, for, for a premier who uh, is, looks like he's rolling right into a majority, which boggles the mind after the last four years, uh, but he's rolling in why the paranoia? Why these extreme tactics? I mean, they arrested and cuffed somebody who was peacefully an invitee to the event. And then they push a small group of 20 protesters, some seniors, people from different groups. Nobody was throwing rocks or anything. Am I correct, Anthony? You guys were being all peaceful. So Wait, yeah. why, why are they doing this self-sabotage? Do you think it's trying to play to the base to look tough? Or like, what are we talking about here? And I'm asking this, I guess, more broadly, because I'm concerned. I'm concerned with what we're seeing in the US. I'm concerned with what we saw in Ottawa with the occupation. And I'm concerned with these kind of tactics a week before a provincial election at a campaign rally from the premier who offered for people to come. So, so let me just ask you if I can, Karima, like, where, where does it go from here? Do you think that this is going to make them think next time not to do it? Or do you think that some people are going to feel emboldened by what happened to you? I mean, what is your what is your thought? I think they did it because they can. And it's really that simple. And uh, Anthony, you? Uh, I, I think it's a matter of there's I don't I think at this point, they're certainly not scared of the election. Um, now, if something magical happens, that's that's one thing. But I, I don't. I certainly, from what all the polls are saying, they're certainly not scared at this point. I think perhaps what this really came down to was the fact that um, I ha would have no doubt that they were in there, that they were expecting that they were going to shoot some final election day footage that they were going to put up somewhere and to try and help some candidates. I'm sure they uh, invited in a bunch of big donors, uh, maybe some corporate donors who came in. I don't know if cargo jets considered a corporate donor. I don't know if they got that space for free, um, but I, I think that they just didn't want to be embarrassed. And we actually had a couple of cars who tried to run our line. I mean, like they would try and like, you know, we would let in one car at a time and the second car would like push right up and like try and speed through. I'm used to that. I've been on enough picket and strike lines to see that happen. Um, but we were also dealing with uh, a group of people who were sometimes walking across the street who couldn't move out of the way that quickly. And I think it's really just, it comes down to, to a level of embarrassment um, that they believe that there's a certain righteousness about the party, which thinks that everything they do is right. And even when they're doing something that's obviously not, they believe in what they're doing is right. And when something is shown up in their face, um, especially when you're defending the rights to protest in Ottawa, and that you can't now defend the right to protest just outside of your own rally, that's shoving something in your face. And maybe that's something that they just didn't want to deal with and didn't reckon with. Because I have to think at least a few people who drove down that parking, that line that we were blocking, were probably saying, 
Oh, well, they probably have a right to protest. There's probably a couple of people who are doing that, but I know we had a lot of scowls and fingers flicked at us. And, you know, ultimately uh, that was the other side of it as well. So I bet you there was a couple of phone calls from people waiting in that line and they got embarrassed that maybe a couple of their high paid donors just couldn't get in as quickly as they thought. Well, what you're describing is violence, right? To, to have those cars come up that close, uh, that's intimidation. What we saw on the videos was intimidation of you, Karima. And so what you said, I just want to end on this point. You said that they can do it. They do it because they can, which is like, ugh. this is a week before the election when parties are supposed to be on their very, 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 very best squeaky clean behavior. I mean, this is this is when you expect all of the, you know, the baby kissing and the, and the promises and all of that, not bullying and the kind of, garbage we saw so if they can do that now when they haven't even won yet what do you think this portends for the next four years in ontario karima well the past four years have been disastrous right um even before the pandemic um i think life did not get better for most people under doug ford um, and I think that the way he approaches government and governance um, is not in service of the public interest. I think that, um, you know, apart from privatizing or adding in middlemen to disperse social assistance, which isn't enough for someone to sustain themselves and cutting protections from vulnerable people and cutting programs seemingly out of spite. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the pandemic obviously brought a lot of that into very sharp relief with the crisis in long-term care. Um, my practice as a lawyer, I focus on housing. Um, so I know that there is a crisis of affordability um, and sort of people being evicted without due process. Um, like there is so, uh, healthcare, education, all of the strikes that were happening even before the, the extended school closures and the questionable policy approach to dealing with COVID. Um, so, so that is you know, what we have endured. And if at the tail end of that, um, he, the, the Ford team, the Ford nation um, believes that using state violence for suppressing political speech is fine um, at, at the end of the campaign. Um, I, I think that the next four years look kind of bleak. Indeed, Anthony? The only solace that I take out of what's been happening over the last little while is what I'm starting to see in Hamilton, especially because that's, that's where I'm living is there is finally starting to become a realization on behalf of a lot of different activists who bring their own lenses to things that there is an intersectionality among all of these issues. So we have environmental rights activists getting together with people on housing and food insecurity and dealing with um, with workers, we're talking racialized workers rights. Um, we're, we're crossing over a lot of these lenses seemingly, I wouldn't say for the first time ever, but people are finally waking up to the fact that we're not going to win alone. We're not going to be able to fight back alone. And until we come together in some sense of solidarity, realizing that all of these intersect with each other, we're really just fighting a losing battle. And that is the one piece of hope that even if on election day, it turns um, a way that we don't necessarily want it to turn, that there is something to go forward with. I can't see the next four years out of the pandemic being anywhere near as comfortable for Doug Ford, whether he has a majority or not, knowing that there is kind of a growing movement across the province that is ready to take him on with almost anything. I think it's going to be a very um, active and I would dare say uh, frightening experience for the next four years for Doug Ford and unfortunately very frightening for people who stand up against him as well. And by frightening, just so we're clear, you're talking about in terms of resistance to policies and, and accountability. We're not talking about frightening in any term of violence or threat, correct? I'm talking about violence that might be done against those people who stand up for such things, just like what happened to Karima. In other words, the more people that are gonna stand up, there's going to be more threats of 
police violence or whomever Doug Ford decides to call in to threaten those violence. I, I mean, I'm not saying that I haven't been at protests where there haven't been people who have gone there with the intention of trying to agitate. I've certainly been there. Um, it's not my style by any means. I've got four kids I have to get home to at the end of the day. And it's really tough for me to choose to get arrested and anything like that. But if I can find ways to try and um, stall things, if I can find ways to ask all the questions that Karima didn't even have the chance to ask because she was arrested so quickly, um, there are ways to try and get done what you need to get done. And ultimately, my fear is that the clamps are going to come down on a lot of good people who are just out there protesting and really never had the chance to even express what they wanted to express while they were out there. Well, let me just end this on that mo note of hope that you brought up, Anthony, because I have certainly seen that here on the Osho in the last years. You know, we've had activists from all kinds of different causes, and everyone seems to understand that intersectionality and wants to work together and understands whether it's Ford or the old guard of Hamilton City Council. There's change coming, and if we can't get the change right away, we are certainly going to work together to protect rights. Um, and so I, I thank you both for being here and having this discussion. And thank you so much, Karima, for having the courage uh, to put yourself out there and to share that video and to take all that comes with that exposure. Um, and, and I hope that the shame lifts and you feel very proud of what you've done and uh, that you really are going to be a mentor and a model for so many others. So thank you for that. And Anthony as well for being out there and for always fighting for the rights of people. Uh, I thank you both for being the voices that people trust on the issues they care about and for joining me on the O Show. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks.